So, so I think we are live now. Welcome to this new Agile Beam Meetup. Hello, everybody. We are very uh, happy to uh, join uh, everybody uh, to get, uh, again for our 15 uh, meetups. So we have two special guests uh, today. Uh, Andre uh, from Spatio, that is, uh, we, we, he will present us uh, a tool that could be interesting to uh, to have to work with uh, iteration, and we have uh, Moro from uh, Frank Boute, and he will present us uh, how they work in uh, their agency, and they have a special uh, uh, Scrum uh, things to to show us. So first, we will start with a short presentation of uh, our community with Sebastian. And after uh, a short presentation of Bilal of the new learning course around, around the Agile Beam. So Sebastian, you will come. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, I shared my screen with a site that you can find at uh, agilebeam.org. So we founded the community uh, two years ago uh, around, and uh, the idea was uh, we, we we, de we developed the application Bricks that you can find at bricksapp.io. And when uh, developing this application, uh, a collaborative platform uh, to, to practice uh, Agile in the field of architecture, we met a lot of people that uh, uh, develop, that use uh, Agile method. So people that uh, inspire from uh, computer uh, world or people uh, like uh, Moro that you, uh, you are going to, to see later. Uh, who, who learn as a Scrum Master, for example. And uh, we wanted to have uh, a space, uh, a place so that people can uh, exchange and to, uh, to put together uh, some documentation about how to practically uh, uh, start with Agile. So you, you, will, uh, you could go to this site, uh, agilebeam.org, and find uh, especially on this page, uh, join Agile Beam uh, community. And you, you will have a lot of links uh, to join the community, so it could be uh, join our Slack to 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 do some day-to-day -day conversation, uh, to go on the LinkedIn group if you want to publish, for example, some example of your uh, your practice. And uh, you, the main uh, one important uh, place is the YouTube channel. So if you go in the YouTube channel, uh, here you find the live, of course, because ah no, <laughs> my my page is not uh, shared. Okay, uh, I will just uh, share again the YouTube channel. Sorry, but uh, I, I will share it. But uh, basically, so in the YouTube channel, we, we put all the meetups, uh, all the meetup. And uh, so this one plus uh, the 15 uh, other meetups that we have made. And uh, you, 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 yeah? Don't hesitate to uh, subscribe to, uh, to our uh, channel, Agile Beam channel, to put the Finger. And we, uh, you, you also have some uh, some short uh, formations so, uh, on uh, on some specific uh, agile approach like uh, how to do a delimiting in the field of uh, AOC, how to do a board uh, to to list your task and so on. So I, I'm going to be short and uh, I just uh, give you the the speak uh, Bilal. So Bilal will present you uh, a new training that we are starting to do. So both in France and now uh, with a coach from the UK. So please, uh, Bilal, can you explain us? Yeah, thank you, Sebastian. So hi, everyone. Uh, we, we, we're going to create a new kind of learning experience, which is a masterclass in English. So we already started in French with, uh, with Francois. And now we will start in English in September 22. So what we learn is very simple. Uh, we, I'm going to give you a link. and. What we learn is very simple. It's to if you want to start working at night and working on the weekend, if you want to learn how agile can improve your daily work, your daily and your collaboration with your colleague and in your team. So, I think it's a good learning. It will be on 22 September, which is uh, on the after after holiday. So we'll be in shape to learn new stuff, new stuff. And it will be with me, and it will be also with um, Edward Murphy, which is a, a smart a Scrum master in uh, in UK. And so uh, I have, last but not least, we have a gift for you, which is a, a coupon, which is a reduction of forty percent for the masterclass. So I just put on the link on the chat to not be too long to, for you. And so see you soon. I hope in uh, in the twenty two September. 
So, uh, and we will learn and enjoy also having a professional learning with uh, professional with a lot of practical stuff, not just theoretical. And uh, it's it will be a, a lot of sec, uh, session after that, but it will be the first. And uh, I'm very happy to announce you today, and very happy also to to give the gift, which is uh, how I, I said um, a coupon of forty percent. So just uh, check in the chat, and you you have all the of all the information. So thank you, and I think it's okay for me. Yeah? Thank you, Bilal. So we have a few of this uh, masterclass in French uh, in uh, in uh, from uh, April, and it will be uh, very interesting to to meet uh, very different people from architect to engineer to uh, to client, and to to try to to search for how we can uh, work uh, better together with BIM and uh, for a better yeah. construction. Okay, thank you, Bilal. Thank you, Sébastien. So we will start with uh, André. So, uh, so André, you, you work for Spatio. Uh, so, and you you will present uh, your uh, very interesting tool. So we'll start with a presentation of uh, thirty minutes, and after we'll have a, a question and answer. So, André, it's up to you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I want to say we appreciate very much the invitation to the Agile BIM meetups. It's uh, really nice to be here and talk about our upcoming uh, platform. Uh, I trust the presentation is visible. Otherwise, uh, please shout out or make some notice. Um, so today I will talk about uh, the current uh, web-based design platform we're uh, developing at the moment it's called Spacio. And I will share a bit about the vision behind the platform and the technology and uh, why we set out on the mission to develop it. Um, so the team developing the platform consists of these three people, where it's me and my two colleagues, Franz and Stian. Uh, all three of us share uh, background and knowledge within parametric design and coding and uh, also experience of working as architects, uh, engineers, environmental designers, and BIM experts. So we decided, the three of us, to join forces and create a company called Data Trees, um, where we develop um, these digital, digital tools. And we have as a mission of uh, enabling access to building knowledge. So we're a startup uh, company from uh, Norway, and we're operational in Norway and Sweden. And we set ourselves out on a mission to make building information reusable and comparable in the industry. Um, because we have to face the fact that in the AC industry, we're creating a tremendous amount of uh, data. and it's very, very limited the way we, we analyze and retrieve that data from our models. And I firmly believe that the ability to capture important information and transform that information to useful knowledge is uh, critical to the ex success of improving our existing workflows and how we approach uh, building design. So we can quite easily see and realize that we're pretty much solving a lot of the same problems over and over in projects. And most projects, they start from quite a blank canvas or that they start from scratch. So even with new technology like parametric design that allows us to capture, store and analyze the information in new ways that maybe wasn't possible in 10 years ago, uh, we still think that in order to gain full benefit of these new workflows, we need a standardized method of how to like create, store, capture, and manage data and knowledge in the industry. Um, according to Statista, in Europe, uh, we're building around 450,000 buildings each year. And as they're estimating or predicting, by 2050, we're going to pass uh, roughly like half a million buildings a year. And then you can start to question like how many of these projects get documented in a way so that new projects can make use of all the experience and knowledge that the, the people got from those projects. Um, so 
coming from a background as working in an architecture office, you quite easily see that building knowledge is quite rarely uh, documented and shared. Um, it's hard to retrieve information and knowledge from projects that other people made. And as I mentioned, that they also usually start from a blank canvas instead of like a solid foundation of uh, data and facts. So looking at a traditional project life cycle, we have uh, the feasibility study, uh, starting point where all projects mostly start out from. What you do is this volumetric, very early concept sketches. And later on comes the design and finally end up with a detailed finished project ready to build. And along that timeline, we all face a set of problems which kind of roughly sketch out looks something like this. In the beginning, you have a lot of freedom. You're not dealing or facing with the struggles, but the further along you come, the problems arise. And the quite roughly, the design process can be sort of sketched out like this, that you start meeting up and joining up with other expertise and um, engineers, and you realize you fall into these pit stops or roadblocks where you have to go back and fix problems. And that's mostly what we do all the time, fixing problems and dealing with things that's made wrong. In the end, we get a set of drawings, uh, PDFs, IFCs maybe, uh, which contains a lot and a lot of data. But there's really no way of searching and filtering through that data in an easy and convenient way. Of course, you can look through folders and bring up old PDFs or IFC files, but it's very hard when coming to a new project of really making use and reusing all that past knowledge. So what if we could create a situation where we retrieve, store, and collect parts of that knowledge and then bring it back to the beginning, minimizing all these problems and knowing that what we're designing is actually not just continuously like walking on a treadmill and never moving forward, but every project we make we get more and more knowledge that we can bring with us to the next one. So, and in order to get to those half a million buildings being built each year, I think that the to get to the future we need, we need to spend a lot less time solving the problems, or same problems over and over. Um, I think we need to focus uh, on designing better buildings. And in order to get the answers and the decisions along the way, it needs to be faster and easier. And in data trees, we firmly believe it doesn't need to be like this, always solving problems over and over. That we believe it's possible that we can collect and reuse and learn from past experience. And then by doing so, we can start like asking quite complex questions along the project timeline. Like how does the centrality of an entrance door to an apartment affect the qu qualities? Or where should I place my windows to get both good views, good daylight conditions, and good energy performance? Or what's the average size of a living room in a two-bedroom apartment? Um, when I'm designing a new one, I want to know how does it compare to the rest of a database, sort of. And how what does the height do for a building, and how high does it need to be in order to block like noise pollution entering the courtyard? or which factors causes a street to have bad wind conditions. These are all very complex questions, but are more easily answered by having a solid foundation of past experience. But then the question then comes, like, how do we structure building knowledge? How do we make it easily comparable and useful? Uh, we know that we have to document all the data, and then we also see that there's a need of a platform to allow the user or the designer to visualize, compare, and iterate through these uh, data sets. Um, the problem that's stopping us from uh, reaching this level is at the moment that the current state in the industry is that we're dealing with fragmented data, very siloed expertises and also non-uniform way of how we represent buildings. And it's a, it's, it's a dam of different, different file formats that don't communicate back and forward. So very easily, it becomes quite obvious that we need to centralize and structure our data 
and come up with like a uniform way of representing buildings so that we know that each project kind of speaks the same language to get this in order to work at a larger scale. And that's the, our solution to this is by representing buildings as uh, data trees and thereby the name of our company. So by data trees, we're referring to that each and every building element or each and every module in the building has a parent and a child relationship. So for example, that if we start off with the building, the building contains the storage, which in, um, in the next step contains the spaces, which in terms contains apertures. And by building up all these um, like hierarchical or logical connections between the elements, we get adaptive and a uniform way of representing and describing a building. And thereby we can create these very adaptive responsive models, which works really well for running different types of environmental analysis on, or in general, like space or data analysis and sort of, and thereby can be more quicker and more creative in our design process. As a response to this, this is where Spacio comes in, um, the design building design platform we are developing. It's a design tool in the web, in the browser. And uh, we see the browser as a very intuitive, uh, easy accessible uh, environment for users to design projects and store and work in, in a collaborative way. And it's very much the typical uh, design tool that you're used to. And in terms, if you compare it to Rhino or Revit or your traditional uh, BIM tool, so you can uh, sketch or work in floor plans or split up modes or control uh, your metrics and spaces and so on. So the, the backbone of the design tool is that we have this uh, database of documented existing uh, floor plans, as I mentioned about this bringing uh, the knowledge transfer or documenting knowledge. So this makes the, the tool fueled by past experience. And the, the way we do that is by collecting and uh, kind of scanning existing floor plans extracting all the logics and design intelligence behind it. And we're thereby making it uh, reusable and accessible within the system. Um, so as a base of Spacio, you have this uh, database of existing, at the moment, existing floor plans, which can help you speed up your design process. And you can also compare and run different types of analysis to it to see what are the characteristics of strength about this floor plan compared to the other one? And you also get these, since it's a data tree representation, you also get these quite flexible adaptive plans that can stretch and uh, uh, shape and adapt to your building form. So as a case that you as a user, you design and split up your floor plans and you can click a space and search and the engine then finds the best matching floor plan. I also get the list of the different kind of qualities in terms of uh, daylight, connectivity, how much of the space is actually furnishable, uh, what's public versus private uh, space in the apartment, etc. Um, and alongside building this database of documented plans, we can also extend it to start looking at quite interesting patterns of data to see, like, to actually compare a new design and see where it fits within a larger data set to see how many of the two bedrooms apartments have quite good furnishable uh, space. Uh, how is that related to the spaciousness of the apartment or the compactness? Does it affect anything about how well you can furnish it and so on. And, and by having access to this uh, database, you're now not limited to only your own expertise, but you're actually expanding and having like a collective uh, intelligence base. And <clears throat> the building blocks of Spacio is the main um, 
I would say elements of that you're dealing with the, in the building. So you have the building, you have a core that connects the different stories in the building. Um, you have a space which in terms is then divided or split up by walls and then apertures attached to the space. So all of these primitive elements or the building blocks, they belong in this, as I mentioned, this data tree. So by changing attributes in different levels, I can click the building and say that I want all windows in this building to be two meters wide. And that would send data downwards in the data tree and then change the values in all uh, apertures. If I go down to a lower level and say I click this story and set the value of all these windows on this level should be one meter wide, it will override all the settings you set on a higher level in the data tree. So by having the relationships between uh, all these elements and also alongside relationship between spaces, which is very crucial and suitable for uh, energy modeling, that we want to know by this space is connected to which other neighbors do I have next to me and which is the adjacent wall between me and my neighbor. And I want to give a shout out to also a, um, app called Topologic and Wasim, who's developing that, where a lot of the inspiration of this system comes from, where it's also about taking a BIM model or a quite complex model and building up all these both horizontal and vertical adjacencies and relationships in a building model. And the beauty of having these relationships is that you can also start to query or ask quite uh, complex questions to the system that you can, for example, say, show me all bedrooms that don't share a wall with any adjacent apartment. And the system then knows about the relationships and will filter these out. Or say, how many apartments do we have in this project that has more than one facade or, or facades towards more than one direction? And just this question in a regular BIM model would be it would be possible to solve, but it's a bit of a struggle to get there. Whereas this is, um, you have that all the intelligence baked into the model and the system. Or as a last example, you can also say, show me all the walls that connect a bedroom to a bedroom, where you know that, okay, these all have to, for some particular reason, have some specific like fire regulation or attribute to it or something. Um, Alongside this system, we're also allowing the user to deal with a set of billing performance parameters, such as um, uh, apartment distributions, floor plan metrics, uh, noise pollution, and a set of environmental uh, um, uh, questions like wind, energy, daylight, and stormwater. These are all typical uh, parameters that you deal in in building projects that you need in one way or the other to solve in order for the building to pass. So um, the, the idea of the system is having these uh, flexible adaptive buildings while at the same time dealing with all these quite complex parameters such as daylight or space allocation or, or a noise assessment. And as we all know, building projects become very very complex complex very quickly and it's generally very hard to maintain and balance all these quite um, conflicting parameters with each other so we're aiming at having them as a real-time simulation meaning you don't have to exit the platform and you get it as a as an instant response and one of the examples as we're facing with the problems with daylight is that you usually come up with a design, you have to get in contact with a daylight consultant, send off your model for simulation, wait a couple of days in order to receive a um, report or simulation back saying that this is everything that's wrong and this is everything that's good with your project. So what if we take all that knowledge and by using machine learning and uh, or AI, I want to label it, create a system where you get the answer to, to your design to know how does it perform uh, instantly. Um, the way we, we do or develop this technology is by standard methods of machine learning that we have a set of training materials. We have an input data 
And we also have the ground truth, which is simulated by a validated uh, software radiance. And then we can then have the prediction in our system. So inside Spacio, the way this works is that when you have your buildings, you place out apertures and you get the, uh, the result or the prediction instantly. And this changes up the design pro uh, process quite drastically because you now don't have to wait for days or weeks in order to get your answer. You get it right away. And there's also the availability of uh, checking which uh, rooms validate with your local regulations in, um, in terms of whether you're in Sweden, Norway, or rest of Europe. And along for the future, we're also looking at how could this, how could we take this to the next step and actually work on a recommendation system where while the user is designing, we're recommending them that, hey, you should place a window here because the majority of the other of these types of room actually have windows on this side and it would make a more uniform um, uh, light level in the room. And same applies also to uh, that we have real time noise prediction. This is the same case where it's usually a one week uh, turnaround in order to get the results. But now the designer or the architect have the tool as, at their hands in order to get these live results of what does it do or how does it affect when I elevate my building. Um, the, the sta standard, um, uh, the current state or the standard format, you usually receive these simulations back in a PDF format like this. Um, which makes it really hard to know what to change in order to improve your simulation or Im Im improve your design. So to get something like this available inside a design platform, these are the aspects we need to look at for noise prediction. That we have uh, like direct propagation, we have the fraction where sounds move around buildings or above buildings. We have the screening effects where it bounces off a facade and cars are not static objects they're movable so we also have to take that into consideration um, but then we see that okay it's not just enough running this simulation to see these are the bad areas and these are the good areas we also need to know how do you actually what is it that i need to change or what's the cause or the source of the problem uh, why this facade has bad areas and um, thereby we offer these um, like data, we reveal the hidden data behind it. So you can click a point and see where are the sound sources uh, that's causing this facade to be really bad. And then you know that, okay, I should probably like close off the courtyard in this area to get better results inside. So as we can say here, it's not just about the data, but it's more about delivering the information you need in order to know what to do. And Inside the platform, we also offer these, as you label as generative design or parametric design, where you can generate and get these different design proposals very quickly and easy in order to build up a um, uh, design spectrum to know that, okay, what are the possibilities of this site? And can I spark new ideas that I wouldn't come up with myself? Um, looking at these urban areas in this kind of scale, we can also make use of um, machine learning in this case by training or picking adjacent or existing context or existing street patterns from cities to say, oh, I'm building, I'm developing a new area here. Let's use the same type of um, patterns or street uh, connectivity that we have adjacent to the site. And you can then have the system then generate the same style or the same typology of streets within your development area. Um, so these types of uh, underlying intelligence drastically speeds up and assists along the design process. Uh, whereas you as a designer then generate proposals and then afterwards pick up where the three or four or five alternatives you like and want to like continue explore. Or if we pick it down to not urban area, we're looking at smaller areas. Again, it's about these uh, generating this design palette of different possibilities where 
where you get the full palette of stuff that you wouldn't think of yourself. And also getting this layer of uh, attached data to it to know, OK, this aligns very much with our targets and the performance we want, or this alternatives might not be the best one, but we're enjoying a lot of other aspects of it, or so more softer values. Um, and also the same logic and uh, way of generating stuff applies to, for example, like space uh, distribution or allocation, where you have a set, certain set of target of uh, apartments you want to fit in your buildings. You can then have the system generate and distribute in order to achieve your, achieve your desired uh, mix. So we also firmly believe that Spacio is not the isolated environment. Uh, we uh, interoperability and uh, all this, we know all the different file formats exist in the industry. So uh, it's of high importance for us to allow the user to enter the system from other tools or other file formats. As an example, you can take, uh, come from an IFC from Revit or ArchiCAD, for example, upload it into the system. You click and decide what's interior space and what's exterior space. And then you have your IFC model up and running in Spacio, uh, built up with all these adjacency rules and the logics. And you can then very quickly run a daylight simulation or do an apartment distribution or whatever type of simulation or performance you want. And we also offer a live connection with Rhino, where if you favor sketching or drawing geometries in Rhino, you can draw your buildings or boxes from there, and it will live update and be sent to Spacio. And you have full control of your buildings where you can edit, sketch, and manipulate, or as we're seeing here, changing categories and calculating areas and manipulating. So with that, I want to thank you for my part. Um, the, the platform is currently in beta stage and please go into the website and sign up for the launch. And if you have any questions, I'm more than welcome to, uh, you're more than welcome to ask them and I will hopefully answer them as for now. Thank you very much, uh, Andre. It was very uh, impressive. Uh, so you you are addressing a lot of different uh, problematic in uh, in our industry. So you your tool work uh, on all these different uh, scales. So from the apartment to the to the city. Yeah, we want to we wanted quite early for it to be a bit uh, very flexible in that sense, if I would say, uh, and kind of create a design system where it allows the user to both operate in the very large scale and small scale as well and uh, we believe that the the main way of solving that is this with the data tree hierarchy again that we we can define a, to what level do we actually render objects is aperture something interesting to see in an urban scale probably not but it still lies there as hidden objects so to say and it was very interesting because it, it remind me that uh, uh, one of uh, our um, uh, <clears throat> one people that uh, inspire us a lot, uh, Joe Justice, who is a very famous Scrum master, he made a, a specific framework from hardware and he, he recommend to use a, a, that he called modular component. So it was for a car, but it could work uh, as I, I understand your, your tool. You have uh, some components you work for, for with room, with a uh, kitchen, with a uh, that have all uh, some constraints and they are connecting uh, together. And that's uh, exactly the, the way he, uh, he, he tried to work with uh, how to develop uh, with uh, agility uh, a car. So it, it could work probably with a, with a building with uh, this kind of, uh, of, uh, of approach. Uh, so you, you talk about, uh, I don't know if you have any other question, but uh, you talk about uh, data structuration. And so what, what are in the future, what are the, the the tools you want to connect with? It's uh, actually so uh, IFC and uh, Reno, as I understand. And uh, so you know, in our uh, you we have a, there is a more and more people working about how to connect some different uh, tools or different software. So what what is your vision about that? 
Um, I would say to, we try to be as uh, flexible and diverse as possible in that aspect because, um, I mean, one of the struggles also mentioned is this whole like the lifespan of data and we i think the industry needs that the, the project doesn't die or it doesn't lose any data value along the the timeline um for a new platform as spacio uh i think it's very important to be connected probably through uh simple apis or uh, useful apis to other platforms because i know there exists a lot of new up and coming platforms that solves projects in a very very a neat complex way and there i see a lot of value of having you don't need to save a file onto your desktop move it mm. upload it but better just communicate through apis and i also think a lot of the if i should say older platform is also moving very much up to the web of becoming more accessible um but as an answer to your question i think it's just what the user base asks for if it's a mm. live connection to Revit or ArchiCAD, maybe that's the uh, way thing. Probably. <laughs> and thank you. And one one aspect that uh, uh, we are very interested in in uh, with agility is the um, is the iteration uh, fact. So uh, how do you deal with uh, how to uh, an architect or an engineer can make some iteration and he can I don't know save uh, some tests and uh, compare things. Yeah, the, the, uh, what's not shown in the presentation is that you would have a, like a dashboard of uh, sketches or mm. design proposals so you can save it as your one, two, three, four, five option. And then, then uh, also a data dashboard where you compare that, okay, option number one have this much square meters, it has this good like daylight performance and so on. Um, so that's not maybe revolutionary or different than what's the traditional way of working. Uh, more that is just accessible on the web and maybe the, the data layers that you can compare different sketches across um, compared to dead IFC files. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's uh, the problem. And you have a, a specific collaborative uh, process, so how to, to have feedbacks from a client or some user? Uh, currently, we've been having it out for beta testing for the energy model. Uh, mm -hmm. which is, uh, I would say, a process of its own. And that's one of the other things we struggle with the platform. At. We will have a lot of users coming in with different demands and different criteria. Mm -hmm. Someone just wants to make a daylight simulation. Someone wants to do an energy model preparation. So um, it's about you're picking which, uh, when you start a new project, you're picking which modules that you actually want to focus on. It's, uh, storm water of any interest for me probably not when i'm going to do an energy model so um, so and that's one of the collaborations we actually had with a norwegian company for uh, energy simulations that we use spasio as an ifc translation to energy model mm -hmm. um, to their energy simulation platform so this is your test actually, and uh, people who are subscribing to the beta test, they are more architect, more engineer, or do you have any ideas of uh, their profile? Uh, it's aimed, uh, as of now, I think it's 50-50 between architects and engineer. So it's aimed at both uh, respective fields, uh, whether you want to design or design a project from scratch, or whether you want to upload an existing project to run a simulation. It's, it's suitable for both uh, areas. OK. Uh, so we have a question of uh, from uh, Edward Murphy. Uh, hello, Edward. Uh, so great presentation, André. Will Spacio provide sensitive analyses that is provide uh, UI information to say what variables, attributes are providing the greatest impact? So I don't uh, know if we can show the question. Uh, I, I think if I understand the question correctly, that there's a UI interface to to control and filter the data. Um, I, because in this kind of tools, there is too much uh, variable. So you you if you change everything, you you don't know uh, what uh, what are the cause of the of your problem probably. So so to try to identify what are the the more important variables to to impact the project. 
Yeah, okay, I see. Uh, th that's something that we're working on at the moment. How to, how does that interface look? How to balance these all different type of simulation in order to make it uh, intuitive <laughs> to know what to do. Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, that's a hard task, and it's something that we're solving at the moment. Okay, uh, and can we have any ideas of the when the the, the beta will be open? Uh, we're aiming at uh, beta opening this year. I would say on during autumn, maybe end of the year. Uh, development time is always super hard to predict, but yeah, uh, sure. some sometime along this year. Okay, so thank you very much. It's, it's uh, very impressive, and uh, we're waiting for to, to to make some tests on your on your tool, and very interesting to to change the way we we can uh, iterate with the the conception of buildings. So about iteration, we will move to uh, tomorrow an hour. Uh, so Moro, I will let you introduce yourself and your company and. Uh, and uh, so you are, you you will will be more focusing about how to <clears throat> to work with uh, iteration and uh, to work uh, more specially with uh, with Scrum. So go on, Moro. So you have to open your mic, yeah, just yes, yes, <laughs> absolutely, perfect. perfect. Let's go. Excellent. Well, uh, first of all, hello. thank you very much, Andre, for your very very interesting presentation. It's perfectly in tune with what we do, with what I'm going to present to you. And it's uh, it, it, it's great. Uh, thank you, everyone uh, who's watching. Uh, thank you, Agile Beam, for this great opportunity to participate in this discussion on advancing uh, the practices in the construction industry. Um, I would like to uh, talk to you uh, today. I will... Uh, I will tell you three things in my presentation. Uh, the first one is who we are at Frank Boutet Consultants. Uh, what, what is it that we do, for whom we do it, and, and most important, why we do it, uh, the, the, the things that we do. Uh, the second thing that I will uh, tell, uh, tell, uh, tell you about is uh, how we do it, uh, the analysis, the performance analysis, the um, uh, the consulting services that we provide to our clients and the uh, complex uh, models that we developed and how we do it. And uh, I will focus mainly on the methods, on how we communicate and how we treat information, how we make it accessible for our teams, the information that we produce. And I will not, uh, I will not spend so much time talking about specific tools, although I will mention them. And uh, lastly, the number, the, the, the third uh, uh, thing that I will mention that I will talk to you about is the results that we have had after implementing uh, this processes, this uh, agile, this agility um, into, into our uh, fr uh, workflow. Uh, at the end, I, I, of course, I will do my best to answer all of your questions and perhaps we will, uh, we will all be able to get a glimpse of what the immediate future for our industry will, will, will bring, right? Uh, so uh, without uh, uh, further ado, uh, I will start talking about uh, our company. Well, uh, Frank, uh, Frank with a consultant, we are an uh, environmental design uh, workshop that was uh, created in 2007. Uh, here I have the privilege to work with a very talented team of hybrid profiles. We are architects, we are uh, urbanists, we are engineers, we are designers, uh, we are creative minds that are trying to uh, do, uh, and that are actually doing uh, really awesome stuff and projects and thrilling projects divided in the uh, offices in Paris, in Bordeaux, in uh, Nantes, and in Rennes in, in, in Paris. We have a regional approach, uh, but we are uh, the uh, the core of our practices is the Paris agent uh, office. And like we said, we cover a wide spectrum of uh, disciplines and, and skills that we have, and, and we treat stuff like uh, bioclimatism, passive strategies and building designs, comfort, environmental modeling, uh, energy, but uh, also uh, resource optimization uh, simulations for water, waste, 
and uh, we also do uh, quite a lot of work about on um, envelope optimization um, renewable learning studies and uh, well and the and site analysis and especially now that the new uh, french environmental uh, uh, building code regulations are, are, are coming into place we are starting to do a lot of uh, life cycle assessment and carb uh, carbon uh, carbon footprint analysis for all the all of the new builds that are going to be uh, there are currently being subject to, to this new uh, uh, environmental regulation uh, in France. Uh, of course, we do uh, this uh, for uh, accompanying our clients in the design, uh, during design development uh, to support the uh, decision making through the design process. And we also do uh, performance uh, validation for certification, building certification uh, uh, for, for French. Uh, uh, building certifications uh, uh, systems and also international and, um, and we have uh, several international projects that we're also working on and, and we do a lot of uh, international uh, building certifications. Um, like I said, um, well, we participate throughout the process of uh, conception of a, of a building and basically our, uh, our intention our, our goal, our main goal, is to make complexity really simple to understand. So, so, I, I, so it, it, it truly resonates a, a lot uh, with uh, with what Andre said about uh, uh, getting people to actually uh, be able to access the information. You know, to just to peel off these layers of complexity and just get to the core of what is really, really important to know, to understand, so people can make decisions. So the engineers can get creative and imagine uh, new solutions. So uh, we basically turn to building science to resolve these complex problems with a very, very simple approach, as simple as we uh, as we do. Uh, we make uh, we use um, a matricial approach to cover uh, a lot of uh, subjects, and and here I I can talk about the five pillars of our environmental design philosophy. Uh, I will not spend a lot of time <laughs> in, in 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 each one of them, but but it's it's an approach that, that's been honed uh, and perfected for the, the past uh, uh, fifteen years. So 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 it it. We have gotten to a point where we understand uh, the holistic uh, effect of building a project, the effects not only on the resources, but on the side, the local dynamics, the uh, biodiversity, the, the ecosystems that are, that, are, uh, that are there. And we use this matricial approach to develop the best combination of strategies that will have, uh, the, 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 that we help our clients to uh, co-design and co-implement in their projects. Uh, of course, um, our, this, this five projects, uh, uh, pardon, excuse me, uh, these five pillars of our, our, of our philosophy are then uh, turned around and turned into specific actions that we help our, our clients. Uh, like I said, um, we, tend to uh, start at the building level, but we do not limit ourselves to the building level. We work with uh, private developers, private owners, commercial real estate companies, but also uh, we accompany um, uh, authorities or uh, the representatives of larger territories that are looking for uh, ideas to develop uh, comprehensive uh, strategies or uh, regional development politics, and, and, and we uh, and we touch uh, cross projects at, at every scale. So this is really really exciting, and uh, we became to know uh, uh, to understand that uh, to fully understand a project in its whole and fascinating complexity. Uh, we came to the conclusion that it's out, there is a lot of data that, that needs to be analyzed, and uh, we need and, and we understood that we need not only advanced tools but a really really uh, efficient, highly efficient workflow. And that is what I will talk uh, about in, in this next section. <laughs> uh, well, uh, 
well, this is the reason why we do it, of course. Uh, why we do it, uh, why why it, it it's worthwhile to take the, the time and develop this workflow because we need to mitigate the effects. We need to be realists, not to be alarmists, but to understand the profound effect that humanity is it's, it's having on the planet. So how are we going to help adapt uh, the cities, adapt the development of societies? Well, we need to implement all of these strategies. Our approach, uh, like I said, it has been is the product of the development of over 15 years of experience of uh, uh, a variety of uh, profiles, and uh, both in our collaborators, our key partners, our clients, and we basically uh, grew from the traditional model of an engineering design firm, uh, where a project manager sit down with a the client, they understand their needs. And they will receive a list, a list of requirements and expectations, which are then transferred to the production team that, uh, 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 with specific uh, uh, details about the deliverables. And upon the reception and validation of these deliverables, the project is moved to the next phase. Uh, the basic work, this basic workflow, which can be said uh, understood as a waterfall approach. It worked very, very well and allowed uh, Frank Boutet Consultants, our company, uh, to position itself through hard work and many success cases, uh, uh, thankfully. Uh, we position ourselves as a leader uh, and one of the most relevant actors in the French AEC ecosystems. So we performed environmental analysis. Uh, here I, I present you some of the uh, uh, of the early, uh, of the uh, key project relevant projects over the last decade, and we performed environmental analysis uh, for deep energy renovation of iconic buildings and palaces around uh, around Paris. We also developed a very comprehensive, a highly detailed cartography of the Haussmannian city fabric in Paris. Now that you mentioned Andre about the uh, the, the pattern of development of cities. We 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 developed like uh, our director Frank uh, participated extensively in the development of an atlas of the uh, Parisian urban fabric. So we understand it very very well. Um, like I mentioned, um, with the passing of the years, uh, this workflow was improved. Uh, new approaches were developed, and uh, um, we. We were keeping with the pace of the growing demand and reactivity um, uh, that that was needed. Uh, around the tenth anniversary of the um, uh, of the office, uh, we started to see that the, the traditional waterfall-based model of conducting projects will eventually fall short, uh, especially considering that with the advent of uh, AI and new challenges that were uh, starting to uh, we do not have any uh, uh, specific idea of what was coming to the horizon with the pandemic, but we understood that the rate of uh, the exponential growth in the development of the um, design tools and uh, uh, the challenges that there are inherent to the construction industry, we understood that we needed to shift a little bit our focus and start to look uh, uh, elsewhere for new methodologies. Um, and that is, uh, and that is where uh, we started to to pay attention to to BIM, uh, to BIM and to Agile. Uh, like I said, right before the pandemic broke, uh, the office was already uh, undergoing a, a, a restructuring of sorts. You know, like redefining exactly how these new workflows will, will be in, implemented or incorporated to the already uh, 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 work the workflow that was already in place and uh, this uh, uh, led us to the exploration of how uh, different workflows uh, facilitated rapid interpolation or rapid iterations between the analysis the complex analysis the models that we developed um, that's where we uh, that, that that's where agile entered into our radar. Uh, here I uh, present you the, the agile manifesto that I'm pretty sure everyone watching this uh, presentation uh, is uh, probably familiar with. But for those who don't, it's basically a set of 
precepts that were developed by a lot of a bunch of uh, nerdy cowboys and rebels in the late 90s that understood that uh, the traditional way of conducting projects was not going to cut it, cut it in the software development world. So they revolutionized basically the approach of uh, conducting or performing uh, project management. Um, here, uh, there, there is another uh, picture that it's always relevant to remember, uh, you know, the, the rate of improvement of productivity across several industries. Uh, many people probably are familiar with this graph, uh, with, with this graphic, but it's really, uh, just to show how uh, how uh, laggard the construction industry is compared to manufacturing or uh, technology or other technology development uh, fields are. So, well, it's very important to develop these new kind of approaches. Uh, we particularly like to think about agile through the lens of uh, the definition brought forward by Dave Thomas in his uh, his wonderfully titled 2015 presentation, Agile is Dead. <laughs> Harry, well, he's, he's one of the founders of the, uh, of, well, the signatories of the original Agile manifesto. And he, uh, we, and you can, you can uh, Google uh, his presentation. It's very, 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 very interesting. Uh, well, he basically boils down the point of agility, not so much to the specific methodologies, but to the philosophy, or do you, first you find out where you are, you take a small step towards your goal, you define your goal, and you adjust your understanding based on what you've learned. So you repeat it and you repeat it. And, and what, what, it, what is very, very important is that when faced with two or more alternatives that are delivered the same amount of value, you take the one that will make future change easier. So this, this is this is a key element. And it's very important to to understand how we're going to move forward. So with that in mind, um, we then uh, came to this uh, idea of developing a in-house approach for a Scrum-inspired workflow that we're going to develop into our into our office. Uh, well, uh, we're still, uh, well, and, and we developed this specific formula to, to adapt for, to be adaptable for our teams because uh, it, there are many, many similarities of what we do with the, with the, uh, with the Scrum uh, framework. You know, we, we develop project backlogs. We understand all the things that need to be done through all of the design phases of the project. We understand uh, where are, uh, for each phase of the design, we understand which are the epics, which are the goals, the objectives, and we uh, break it down into sprints for deliverables. And we understand that first we need to do like solar irradiation analysis before we can get into the details about the, uh, the specifics of the thermal envelope. And we cannot do um, mechanical MEP uh, sizing, or, 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 or excuse me, or, uh, we cannot start to look into the specifics of the technology that will be used to heat or to cool a building if we have not done before the other steps. So, so there's there's this uh, uh, thing about. Uh, the successive stages of design, but also the reactivity needed because priorities can shift very, very easily in a construction uh, in a in a construction project. So uh, what we did, uh, what well, what we did, what we did is that we reformulated, we re rethink the roles within our uh, office to adapt it to this agility base or this Scrum inspired uh, methods. That we developed. So uh, here I will talk to you about uh, the roles in our in our office. At the higher level, um, we function as a very conventional uh, engineering firm, or, or, or uh, where the uh, general direct, uh, director is the person that is in charge of engaging uh, the market, our existing customers, or uh, key partners with the help of what may be called the rainmakers, which are the people that make the, 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 the that bring in the projects. And they engage and they 
uh, nurture these uh, relationships to bring in new business opportunities. When a new project is brought into our, uh, our company, um, there is a role that is a key role that is the, the, uh, the direction of operations. The direction of operations validates uh, the mission, the, he, uh, they approve the budget, and they assign a project manager for each one of the new projects that are going uh, to be executed in the, in the office. And they ensure the communication and the project fluidity, and they uh, they manage the relationship, the, uh, the contractual relationship with the client. Each of the projects, like I said, is assigned to a project manager who is going to be in charge of managing the budget, defining the project objective, uh, objectives, excuse me, uh, and the goals, and the project, and defining the project priorities. But uh, but it is really important to to see that the uh, Scrum parallelisms start uh, forming uh, at this stage because they truly take ownership of the project of the product. So they are the POs. So this is kind of a, uh, a, a two-sided uh, project owner, the direction of operations, and the project managers because they will. Uh, they, they understand the contractual engagements that we have with the clients, so they take fully ownership because they need to make sure that in the production side of our office we understand and, uh, and they look for uh, uh, they look out for the interests interest excuse me of of our clients. So uh, it's really interesting. And then there is this another this other figure, which is the direction of studies, which is in charge of uh, not so much uh, managing the contractual relationship with our clients, but it's more toward the inside of our organization. Uh, the director, uh, director of studies works, uh, coordinates, and co-validates with the project managers uh, the objectives, the goals, uh, the acceptability criteria for the increments that are going to be provided. So we can, Talk about we will talk about the increments that we create as a deliverable for a design process, um, but but he is in charge of coordinating the deployment of resources in our office. Resources being material resources, but also the uh, the timekeeping of, the, of, of the, the the workload for each of the team members. Uh, he validates the assignment of the team members the, the, for each project when the project manager start uh, uh, defining the priorities of the project. Uh, we have a we have a office that it's very transversal and uh, we know the profile profiles of each other. So they have an, in, an initial idea of whom may be the best person that, that it's best fit for for a specific analysis, and they put forward their pre-selection of the team uh, members that are going to be activated into this project, the direction of studies, he validates this uh, selection. And he ensures overall the communication and facilitates the team, uh, the, the, the workflow of the team. So in this, uh, if we carry over the parallelisms, the direction of studies is uh, the scrum master that's going to be uh, working. The parallelisms, although, are not uh, direct because here we are talking of several projects working in parallel with the same Scrum Master. But uh, we, as we will see, uh, the ceremonies that are how we adapted the ceremonies allow for this. Like I said, when the project uh, projects start, it is the responsibility of the project manager to take ownership of the project to to see that all of the uh, design phases are deployed in the uh, sequential manner, and, and, and we understand this uh, this uh, to be larger than uh, a sprint. The sprint are typically uh, divided uh, are subtasks divided uh, that last between uh, one or two weeks, sometimes less if we are really pressed for a, a construction permit or something like that. Uh, so uh, they oversee uh, the the overall uh, advancement of the, of the project, but at every every day periodically they do uh, status updates with the with the engineers that are affected to to the project to start developing the technical studies. But the director of operations is continually uh, seeing where the roadblocks may be 
and facilitating the um, uh, uh, the work of everyone and understanding for the next two or three sprints where the work load, the, 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 the heaviest workload will be. So he's in charge of reshifting the team members between sprints. This is very important because it's the, usually uh, in Scrum, it is the same team that is in charge of developing the, the, the whole product. But here we take a customized approach that's more chopped up into these small increments of which I will talk in, uh, in, in a couple of minutes. So, so he's in charge also of shifting these pieces, you know? Um, but of course, uh, the people responsible of producing these increments are the team of uh, which I'm proudly part. And I can tell you that it's, uh, it's a, a, an incredible team of people, uh, young, motivated, really, really capable, uh, of understanding the complexity of the buildings and producing really easy to understand uh, answers to the questions that are, that, are, that are asked by the designers, the engineers. So, of course, they are the ones responsible of ultimately validating the feasibility of the goals of, for each uh, sprint. They understand what is the type of analysis that needs to be done, how long it takes, how difficult it may be due to the complexity, uh, how easy it will be if the design team, the architects are working in any specific beam or pad or, or, or paper-based uh, platform to communicate their ideas. So uh, this complexity is really up to the team members to, to determine and to validate. They develop, they understand, and they decide how the sprint tasks will be performed. And uh, the way that we uh, coordinate is by our ceremony that will, it, it's kind of a daily, uh, weekly scrum that we call the campfires or le feu de camp uh, in French. And it's uh, this ceremony that it's held uh, at the beginning of each week that ensures the, uh, the shared understanding and the ownership of the projects by the team members, by the engineers, the architects that are actually doing the hard work or, or are the, the boots on the ground. Uh, we identify impediments and common obstacles, which is, is, is the same as, uh, as the daily scrums, but it's, it's, it's in a larger scope within a week. And what, what, are we, what did we do last week? What are we going to do this week? And if we have any obstacles. And we work together to identify who's the best person to come help us remove these obstacles and keep working. Uh, well, this uh, reinforces the uh, uh, the continuous improvement spirit of the team, um, and and it also helps the, optimize the way uh, that we are going to develop as engineers because we understand what are our key uh, strengths and what type of uh, situation we work best, what type of analysis, and we uh, and it helps the direction of studies, which is in charge of uh, coordinating these uh, on fires to understand which will be the best uh, professional development pathway for each of the engineers, for, for each for one of the team members. Uh, of course, uh, we uh, here I, I will I will reference a very another very interesting presentation that the, that you can also find in YouTube. Uh, it, it was done by uh, Andrew Corney from Sapphira, and he talked about it also about how to implement ag agility in the uh, in the design workflow for buildings. And uh, because during the campfires, we need to understand what are the increments that need to be done. We understand the objectives that have been communicated by the project managers, and we understand that the how how we need to uh, develop the analytic models that we have. Uh, so what are the increments? What are the answers, the, 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 the work that we need to be done? In his presentation, uh, Andrew talked about the concept of uh, mice-sized uh, increments or elephant-sized increments. And both uh, the first ones are really uh, trivial and they do not contribute to project value. And the elephants are impossible to do. To do. So he talks about dot size increments. The, uh, these increments that are the correct size to uh, to provide value, uh, to be manageable by a, by a team member, and to be produced 
uh, at the end of a week or, uh, or at the end of two weeks of the intervention that, that, that we will have. So uh, we focus on these dive size increments that are really manageable uh, and we develop them. Uh, another uh, key uh, thing is that we use uh, a lot of tools. Um, here, uh, like I mentioned, uh, I made a focus on the methodologies that we use, but uh, in reality, the tools that we use are uh, all of the uh, latest and most common used uh, uh, by design firms. And we are, we truly are tool agnostics. There are a couple of tools that are used more than others, like some or or grasshopper for Rhino, but we can truly integrate into any kind of uh, design workflow from uh, our clients or, or that our partners, uh, key partners are using. But we are also developers. Uh, we are also uh, uh, developing uh, tools in uh, scripting tools that allow for the uh, playing with the morphology of buildings of at the urban level based on key environmental um, indicators. Uh, right now, there is about a dozen of them that, we, that ranges between uh, view access. It, it, it's very similar to, to, what, uh, to what Andre mentioned. Uh, and we, uh, we developed from an initial proposal that it's it put forward by, the, by our, one of our partners or our clients, the architects, and we pass it through MESH to this uh, morphology, environment, sustainability, and human comfort tool that we have developed. Uh, uh, coming next, uh, embodied carbon, uh, and we the, uh, and we let it run and to propose a series of alternatives of optimized alternatives that will that we will then use to influence the designer to uh, help the uh, architects to to improve their design. So it's it's it's, it's pretty much similar as as as, as what special does, but perhaps in a more uh, specific context that we use for some of our projects. Project, but we also develop our tools. Um, and now I'm going to, uh, to go uh, to move forward to the, to the next stage of this presentation, and I will talk about the results that we have, uh, the tangible benefits of agility that we have harvested after implementing uh, these uh, new uh, philosophies of working uh, through these very, very hard times in the, in the pandemic. Uh, well, of course, uh, uh, things are uh, common uh, to all of the organizations that start using Agile. We enhance, enhance visibility, the sense of shared ownership. Uh, the teams are, 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 are very motivated. Um, we develop a true sense of psychological safety for, 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 our, uh, for our engineers who are developers in, in sorts. So um, we understand that the, the, the best uh, the the more developed this sense of psychological safety is, everyone will be better uh, able to concentrate on the work, to be really, really a high-performing individual and part of a team. So, uh, but in the terms uh, in terms of organizational results, we have improved the reaction time uh, a lot, and uh, we have increased our capacity to, to seek more business opportunities. And how did this happen? Well, our intention was to turn bars into clouds, and uh, and this is uh, th this is a screen capture of uh, the reports that we have from our uh, uh, from our organization management tool, that, where we see uh, where everyone is uh, going to be working through the coming weeks, and where everyone is assigned to new projects. So we have here the case of three. Uh, Three people, the three engineers that are working in our company. Uh, the first one of them throughout 2020, he was not there uh, for the first month of the of the year, and and, and that's me. <laughs> and but the other two are are uh, are very very uh, uh, efficient engineers that I have the pleasure to work with. And here we can see that the, the, in the traditional way of uh, assignment uh, assigning um, sorry uh, the workload for projects. We have the uh, we can see these bars that when we started implementing agile were start, uh, started to decompose and transform into clouds of points, and these represent actually actually the amount of increments that we are able to to produce. 
because we are now capable of assigning and reassigning the engineers to intervene in several different uh, 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 projects and develop their uh, specific increments. There's dog size increments that are very manageable uh, uh, and, and feasible, and they produce a lot more. And here we can see uh, that through these uh, hard times of COVID, uh, these, uh, the implementation of these uh, agility-based uh, methodologies uh, helped us uh, increase the amount of projects that a team member can handle in average. So we have a very good uh, trajectory trend line uh, that, that continues to improve. Uh, the, uh, the, well, the data, for, of course, for 2022 is just the first semester. Uh, but, but but it's really really interesting to see how this reshifting of the uh, ownership of the projects and the communication within our organization uh, helped uh, bring up also the monthly uh, RFPs that we, that we received and uh, as an organization. Uh, of course, uh, there's a tendency to have to get a lot of more uh, uh, requests uh, by the end of the year. So that's why this there's a little bit of lag there in 2022 but we can we can see by tangible numbers that are in our uh, organization software that, that that we can see the results of a better communication in our teams uh here um, and, and this uh, just to uh, wrap up <laughs> this this talk i will i will show you some recent projects that uh, that are interesting and where we have applied this um uh, interoperability and agility, uh, agile methodology, methodology for communication within our teams. This is a headquarters of, for our uh, uh, for a cosmetics uh, company that we develop uh, with our uh, one of our uh, key partners, uh, the, the architects, Oxo Architects. And this is a very interesting uh, expansion of a exist, existing building because it's brown. It's wooden. It's uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, environmental uh, factors that need to be taken into account because it's subject to the new French regulations. So there's a high emphasis on thermal uh, uh, summer comfort and low carbon uh, materials. So these are some screenshots of the kind of studies that we uh, that we developed. We started in basic. Uh, Excel spreadsheets, just analyzing, sorting out the, 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 the information. We imported the Rhino model and we developed uh, um, some uh, a script for easily uh, changing or making variations on the geometry. We developed and we tested uh, around 360 different uh, variations for, um, for shading solutions uh, in, uh, in relation to the uh, orientation of each of, of each of the of the windows and for, by orientation we develop a specific set of guidelines uh, for the architects it, it was a really really interesting and, and constructive experience uh, another uh, recent project that we uh, a couple of week, weeks ago we we got the first uh, place on the, on the uh, in, in a competition to redesign uh, the exterior pedestrian pedestrian areas of Notre Dame in the heart of Paris, like, like, like you know, uh, the cathedral is undergoing a major uh, uh, work due to the uh, devastating fire that took place. Uh, but the, the but the city took the opportunity to redevelop all of the pedestrian areas, and here we are going to be performing some really interesting, this is an upcoming project, and uh, here we are going to be developing really, really interesting uh, urban scale um, uh, thermal comfort modeling, uh, the cool island effect, it's going to be uh, explored, uh, coupling this uh, refreshing effect that the, that the river will have, and, we, and the active cooling strategies, uh, the, the hybrid active and passive cooling strategies that we will develop for these exterior areas, it's going to be something really, really interesting. And uh, managing this incredible, huge amount of data can only be done by implementing uh, agile principles. And uh, here, I uh, this is uh, Paris 2024 for the uh, project that's going to be uh, that's be currently being built in the north uh, in the north uh, side of Paris 
for the Olympics. It's going to be hosting the badminton and gymnastics uh, uh, events in the Olympics and Paralympics. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's an arena. It's a really, really complex project. We have a contractual uh, uh, engagement uh, written in place to a performance. Uh, uh, it's a performance, valid, uh, perf energy performance engagement or, uh, and environmental. So we develop one of the, uh, not, not the most complex uh, uh, energy model that we have developed, but it's one of the most co ener uh, complex energy models that we have developed. And it's a challenge because it needs, it needs to be calibrated to what the uh, results of commissioning will bring forward. So we developed this from the initial preconceptual basis of design uh, when, when, when we were in the competition. Uh, and we develop uh, uh, and we carry the ball forward all the way. And we're going to be developing this calibrated uh, energy model that it, it's going to have to correspond to real life data measurements and the variability that, that, that will come with the exploitation of, of, of this, uh, uh, the operation of this building. So it's going to be, it, it, it is really interesting right now how we're going to, uh, how, how we are. Uh, doing the regular updates for the project, just seeing how uh, the construction is it, it's, it's advancing and how we are going to calibrate this highly complex energy model. Uh, lastly, just to wrap up this presentation, uh, this is a personal uh, reading recommendation that uh, helped me understand a lot of the complex dynamics be behind uh, uh, be behind high-performing teams and how to avoid uh, 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 how to avoid information silos within organizations. It's a, it's a, it's a very, very good uh, uh, read that I highly recommend. Uh, it's written by the, an American uh, general that was in charge of developing the strategy in the Middle East uh, in the early 2000s. So it's a, it's a really interesting book. Um, just to close out, uh, it's, it's a question, it's a call to action. Are, are, are you prepared? Are we all prepared to the challenge of this uh, deluge of data that's going to, to take us and as an industry? Uh, what are we going to do? Are we going to be innovators and develop the, the skill sets and the tools that are needed? Or, or what are we going to do? And with this, I thank you very much and I look forward to hearing your questions. <laughs> Thank you very much, Moro. It was uh, very interesting to have a real example of a company who, who are implementing uh, this kind of uh, agile practices. And so, uh, so how many people you have in your company? You don't, you didn't mention it, I think. Uh, we are currently uh, thirty-six or thirty-seven, if I don't get it wrong, because with the regional offices, I, I may be not up to date, <laughs> but okay. most of our staff is, is in Paris. Okay, and so who, uh, so um, ah, we have a question of uh, Edouard now, so we can start with uh, Edouard, okay. Again, a good presentation, Moro. Um, <clears throat> do you have a issue in getting clients to accept the Agile Scrum approach to design and value management? Or are you using Agile without saying to clients it's Agile? <laughs> ah, good question. It's okay. Well, yes, of course, there is a, there is actually a whole branch of agile that it's been developed to to include uh, contractual negotiations and uh, and developing contractual relationships in an agile manner. But I can say that in uh, as as far as it goes to the contractual relationship with the, with our clients, it's a it, it's a traditional one. The, it's the approach that we take, but but, but it, it's very much in line when we cross this threshold to the interior of our organization that we are have the flexibility to 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 accommodate several projects projects running in parallel. But it's actually uh, part of the. Uh, uh, the, the the importance of the the, uh, the the role of the ownership of the, the project managers that they don't we don't need to uh, uh, well it's not that we are hiding anything but we don't need to bother uh, our clients with the, the concept of agility because, because we understand and they take the role of uh, looking out for the interests of the client the project managers and the direction of operations 
Uh, so we are fortunate in that way that we can uh, distinguish the interior and the exterior of our organization. Uh, and of course, we are transparent on, on the way we are the, uh, delivering the value and, uh, and we can adapt to a more traditional uh, workflow that is expected from the, uh, from, from the industry. So it's more yeah. just agile. agile. Yeah, um, sort of, yes. <laughs> Okay, uh, and and so and but so so it's it's uh, in fact it's thanks to the COVID that you implement this uh, new approach. And so, who uh, really who initi initiates that, and how how do you uh, make your your way in a, um, in trying to transform all the organization like that? Well, it's not it's not as much as as. as uh, getting our way or, or trying to transform actually like like i mentioned the transformation was already undergoing before the pandemic hit mm, okay. so there, there was this uh restructuring this reinterrogation of how the how the office could improve the already uh, established workflows that we had so a lot of uh, a lot of that went to the the way uh the 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 office presents itself and how they understand the needs from the client. And there, there was a, a, a really nice, neat effort uh, uh, that 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 bring in brought in into the practice of the office uh, at this level. Uh, concepts of uh, design thinking, of understanding the the value that we're going to be proposing to our clients. But this this predates uh, my arrival in the office and this uh, uh, and the exploration of new communication. Uh, structures or, or, or ceremonies within our organization. So uh, we are fortunate in that way that the direction or the general direction of the, of, of the office has always been on the lookout for ways to improve the, the way we work, the way we talk. So, and it shows, and, 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 and I'm very, very proud of be, being part of this team and, 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 and uh, um, the people that on a daily basis uh, do awesome stuff, like I said. So that, that's you that uh, begin to implement this new approach. Sorry, it's you that uh, begin to implement this new approach. Uh, you mean me myself as a person? Or, or, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, oh, yes, I, because I, I know that you have a, that you are uh, that you are uh, you have a certification of Scrum Master. Yes, so I, uh, a... I guess it's yes. probably you, well, but. Uh, well, it, it, it may be it, it may be that in the way that I, I I came out with the idea of the parallelisms to to, to Scrum. Uh, let's say that maybe I put the name on top of things, but uh, there are it's part of a process that was well before me before I came, and it was uh, I adapt. Uh, I, I perhaps I did not mention it, but uh, I I I I am one of the more, I guess you can say, senior members of our production team, but, 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 but I, and I take charge of, you know, like facilitating work a little bit, but I'm not the Scrum Master. That's really important to say. Uh, I am a part of the team and, and, and I think everyone has the potential to, to become the Scrum Master, the facilitator of the work of everyone else. So, uh, so that's another thing that is not directly as Scrum, but I can uh, I I could not say that it was me that brought agility into our organization because because it was already there. Perhaps I just gave it some uh, interesting new names <laughs> to it. But there there are, there are principles that were already being implemented. But so do do you recommend to to have this uh, Scrum certification or? Absolutely, absolutely. I I think it's a it's a it's a great way to delving into uh, what agile in general is well, well you start by the by sp the specific methodology which in the in the more most recent uh, uh, guide I think it was the, in 2020 or 2021 that was the first French translation for the scrum guide so so, so it's a it's a really good way a uh, very well structured to get into um, in, into agile. Uh, I, yes, I, I, I will highly recommend it uh, to, to take a course or uh, uh, do a, a formation, like we say in, in French, mm -hmm. to, to, to understand uh, in a better, uh, in a more formal way uh, how mm -hmm. Scrum works. It, 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 I, I will highly recommend it. And so you, you are uh, 
they were inspired by Scrum. So but did you implement all the the artifacts of Scrum? Like uh, you don't uh, talk about retrospective or daily meeting. Is it uh, on your way also? Well, well, the daily meetings are more uh, informal, but they occur every day in the morning. Uh, we, we we get up to date uh, around the coffee machine. Perhaps we're, we're going, what are we going to do? But it's more formal at the beginning of the week. And there are parallel ceremonies also for project owners. The the uh, the, the meetings between the direction and the and the uh, and on the project uh, and the project managers. Uh, but we do not. We still do not have uh, f formalized uh, s things like uh, sprint retrospectives or, or project retrospectives. Of course, we have them in the way of. Uh, what we call uh, capitalizations or capitalization when we finish a really uh, landmark project uh, and we take the time uh, to, to share this with the people. Uh, we, but we have other, uh, other artifacts or other ceremonies that are not part of Scrum that are being developed by us. It's our very own recipe. We have something that is really, really cool that it's the Le Jeudi du Pourquoi. It's the why Thursdays, the Thursdays of the why. Why we do it, why we do what we do. And these are a series of, uh, of really nice um, technical, also uh, technical presentations that are delivered by some uh, member of their team. Uh, it's, it's, it's an internal presentation, it's sort of like a meetup. And, and, and we talk in detail about some specifics of some uh, uh, aspects of, of, of of, of relevant projects in our organization. So, uh, and, and these are the occasions that uh, to share and to understand uh, a lot of the philosophy of the of, of the office. So uh, it's not part of Scrum, but we develop also our, our little uh, ceremonies. Yes, it's interesting. So, uh, Scrum is just a tool and you, you, you try to, after you develop your own uh, agility, uh, exactly. starting from Scrum. Exactly. Okay. And so when you when you work with uh, other um, consultant or with architect or other engineer, do you explain? Uh, did you explain your? Do you explain sorry the, your your methodology uh, and uh, like uh, for clients, <laughs> or is it ghost agile also? And and do you think uh, all uh, other partner uh, could work with agility with you or be or be in a global process for a specific project, for example? Uh, well, we haven't developed agility or, or this approach with our, our, our partners, but they 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 understand, and we uh, and we they understand that we are quicker in the uh, in the way we respond, and that we adapt the deliverables. This happened in a in a in a good in a in a in a project that I was. Uh, where, where I ended up being the project manager also uh, on top of the uh, energy modeler that uh, uh, let's say that uh, that that I started uh, to take over some, some some of some of the relations with with the architects, but it was really interesting and we get into this conversation because we can we can be really uh, reactive and we can uh, respond to their needs and develop the specific type of analysis that they needed. Uh, uh, and we uh, have the uh, agree their agreement on changing the format of the of the deliverable that we're going to provide. Typically, it's a, it's a technical report, uh, descriptive notice uh, uh, with all of the details of the calculation. And we agree that this document will be done, but at the end of the of, of the intervention, at the end of the schematic design phase. And for the intermediate deliveries, we will not focus on developing a technical report. That uh, at the end of the day, uh, it's it, it's passed down to the client. Uh, uh, but all of the uh, introductory parts, the methodology, all that is overlooked, and they go straight to the pictures, straight to the conclusions, to uh, to the analysis of A, B, or versus C, and what's going to be the the most optimal. Um, uh, uh, solution. So we 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 negotiated that, and we decided to only do intermediate deliverables in the in the in the in the form of uh, PowerPoint presentations of PDFs that, that will be uh, explaining in a very very graphical way uh, the key elements of the analysis, and at the end present the client with uh, the next steps and the decisions that need to be taken. 
and this uh, this facilitated the work of the architects also, but and and allowed us to to continue this uh, highly uh, 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 rapid iteration cycles between the managing or different projects running in parallel. So we didn't uh, need to explain to them the specifics of the methodology, but we just told them this is going to work and they, we believe that this, this is going to work and we are going to present you with deliverables, intermediate deliverables that will be useful, a lot more useful than a 30 page long uh, technical document, which at the end we, we did uh, at the end of the phase of schematic design and we accompanied it uh, in the form of annexes with all of the intermediate uh, 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 presentations that we that we developed so it's, it can be adjusted also uh, when we're yeah. working with other but, engineering or other architectural firms but did you have discussion uh, with uh, some architect or engineer on, on how to implement uh, agile in their company uh, are they curious about that uh, yes well uh, actually the, there was a conversation that that, that went a little bit like uh, uh, at the, around that time, I found the work that is being done in Switzerland by uh, this, uh, with the uh, uh, with the agile uh, contracts. Uh, uh, I'm skipping my mind that the, the name, his name is Mirko, I think the, the, the guy that's doing this in Switzerland. Uh, uh, and and I mentioned that to, to one of our clients because uh, it, it was a it was a complex. Well, uh, all of the projects are complex. But it was a project that was in the Middle East with people working from England, from France, and from other countries in the Middle East. So uh, it, it, it was a lot of moving plates that needed to be uh, to be coordinated. And it was right at the beginning of a new design phase. And uh, I, I, I mentioned that it may be uh, interesting to analyze the idea of alternative contractual uh, definitions. Uh, for all of the for, for all the key partners, uh, and I believe it, it's it's something that 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 is going to be developed because it it is needed to to have agile uh, contractualization of responsibilities, and it's going to be it's going to stop being so much of a ghost uh, uh, initiative <laughs> from from the part of, of some people. Okay, uh, I don't know, uh, guys, if you have a other question. Uh, just uh, the more the the more challenging to to switch from uh, classical to agile methodology. What is for you? Uh, what is more challenging to convince people internally and to change their methodology? Uh, you you face some problem or it was very smooth. Well, it, it has been smooth. I think it, it, there are natural uh, worries that come out. In terms of, are we going to respect the budget, <laughs> the schedule? Uh, are we going to be? Are, are we sure we are going to be relocating that much? Uh, some uh, well, at, at the end of the day, it is necessary because we have a lot of projects running in parallel. But sometimes there's there might be some apprehension uh, uh, when we're. Uh, uh, assign when the assignments are being done, uh, we we'll still need to develop a higher degree of uh, of, of confidence that uh, that a specific profile, a specific engineer, is going to be able to to develop a highly uh, complex uh, model, perhaps in increments, but it's that it, he's not necessarily going to be spending three weeks on. Uh, uh, on the same project, you know what I mean. It's, 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 there, there's this, oh, there's always this apprehension that, 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 that not wanting to let go uh, some of the most experienced engineers to other projects because of fear of no, of, of missing the beat uh, uh, when the deliverables are going to need uh, to need to be produced. So, so it's 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 a little bit more of managing uh, the expectations of the uh, of the clients or, or the project owners that are going to be satisfied with uh, people uh, shifting a little bit more than usual not necessarily uh, staying in the in the bars like i like like i showed in the in the, in the graphics being okay. Okay. Uh, uh, being open to more uh, 
spread spread out the the, the, the talent of, and the and the intervention of the people. It, it can be a little bit challenging. Okay. Okay. Just just before to finish, we had a, a question from uh, Michel Collet, and I think it it was before uh, more of start. Uh, it, it it was for um, Andre. So the the, the question was, uh, what construction materials are considered? I think he, he referred to to the simulation. I think. Um, uh, we, if I understand it correctly, we're um, looking at a system of being able to test out, like, if you go with uh, timber structure or if you go with steel and concrete, how that affects uh, the thickness of the slabs or the spans that you're able to do. Um, that will be or it will be a collaboration with a construction company. So it will be as, as a structure mod, uh, module inside Spatio, and that also connects to an LCA uh, calculation mm -hmm. approach, if that's the materiality he's referring to, I guess, for the structure. I think so, yeah, yeah, I think so. So, Michel Collet, feel free to, 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 to talk on the chat if, 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 if it doesn't fit with your question. Thank you. Mm. Um, I think, uh, yeah, we don't have... Another the question. Uh, I have a last no. question from Andre because uh, he didn't mention okay. if uh, for developing his software he's working with uh, an agile approach. You use Scrum <laughs> or something like that? Or? Uh, we probably are. <laughs> uh, since it's just the three of us, I think we can be uh, as agile or quick as we want in taking different directions, which we definitely have done over the time. Uh, we just uh, the other week decided to do some major rewrite of the system. Um, so in that case, I'm glad that we're quite few people. So it's easy for us to just to reestablish and take a different, completely new direction. Uh, would be harder if we would be a big team. So I guess we're operating within the agile or... or you will, yes, we will, you, will, you will see when you, you you will have a bigger team. And I hope for you, <laughs> yeah. you will develop uh, uh, more your, your software. Uh, okay, so uh, no more question. No, in the chat. No, be it's, okay. it's, uh, okay, it's okay. Okay, so thank, thank you very much, guys. So you're we'll uh, hope that we we can uh, test your software, Andre, very very soon. And uh, and more thank you. We we hope that uh, more and more teams and companies in, the, in our uh, industry will uh, will try to make a, a shift to uh, to agility. So thank you for your feedback. Very interesting. And so uh, see you after the holiday for uh, for a new meetup, uh, Agile Beam uh, meetup. Uh, we hope. Thank you all. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.